Hey there, everyone. This is John Merritt and my co-host, Rob Nothing. Morning. Uh, on today's episode, we're going to be going over Warhammer 40,000 Rogue Trader. Rob, why don't, why don't you talk a, a bit about the history of it? Well, let's just go ahead and assume a couple of things. First of all, you know, if you're listening to this and your assumption is that you're going to go ahead and get a Wikipedia full of information or you're going to get some sort of stockholders report from Games Workshop, this is the wrong place for you to be. This is just a couple of guys who just have some ideas about what they think the Warhammer universe is, what the 40K universe is, what it was and its history and so on and so forth. So just keep that in mind. So if you're going to comment on this, don't go ballistic about some minor nuance that you perhaps know or some piece of trivia that escaped us during this particular podcast. This is going to go ahead and talk about not just the rules, but also kind of the story behind the rules. And that's kind of my forte, if you wish. I am more interested in understanding, you know, how a game came into existence. And I think my good friend, John, will go ahead and go over the nuts and bolts of the rules themselves. I love to tear apart the rules. Yes. So what exactly makes the Warhammer 40K universe? What makes Rogue Trader an aberration to the Warhammer 40K universe, despite the fact that it is the, the father of the 40K universe? Well, I guess for those of you who don't know, or perhaps those of you who do know, we should probably make sure we all understand that Warhammer Fantasy Battle, not Age of Sigmar, was the direct ancestor to the the 40K universe, the Rogue Trader universe. So the Warhammer Fantasy came out first. That is correct. Warhammer Fantasy came out first, 1983, as a matter of fact, if I have that date right. And what Rick Priestley wanted to do and what was called the First Citadel Compendium was create a very short series of rules for those people, those gamers who wanted to use science fiction in the Warhammer games. In fact, the article was called, you know, interestingly enough, Warhammer Science Fiction. And if you look at that, you will see the nascent Rogue Trader 40K universe developing. It is full of weaponry that you should recognize and equipment. The universe has not been fleshed out, but the default is that you can go ahead and use dwarves and orcs and elves as your opponents as well as your protagonists, if you wish. So the game has definitely found its ancestry in that small little egg, that small little, I think it's about eight-page article that was tucked away in a compendium long forgotten in the Warhammer lore. So did this come out in a magazine or was it just an article that came out? It was a compendium designed to go ahead and support the the Warhammer universe. Uh, Warhammer had come out, like I said, 1983, and they recognized that there was some interest in the game as well as interest in the miniatures. So actually it was a Citadel production. Citadel and Games Workshop had not yet consolidated that particular thing. They were just kind of uh, not competing companies in any way, shape, or form, but they were they – were, cooperating and creating this new line of miniatures and games. But so Citadel put this out and they decided to go ahead and, and create uh, rules editions. They went ahead and decided to create uh, illustrations to go ahead and, and showcase future upcoming miniatures. And it was, it was kind of an advertisement, if you wish, more than a, more than a, a gamer's magazine like White Dwarf would become and so on and so forth. Well, that's interesting because um... – so Games Workshop and Citadel were actually two different companies because I've always gotten the two confused. It's, it, it seems like today, every time they talk about Citadel, they're talking about their, their painting portion of the business. Mm-hmm. Yes, from what I understand, and again, for those of you who are listening who are super experts on this, you know, feel free to, to comment. But from what I understand, Citadel was a definite separate company uh, in 1979 that was there to produce miniatures and other supporting three-dimensional material for not only the Games Workshop line of, 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 of games, but also the other titles that Games Workshop had licensed, anything from D&D uh, through uh, even uh, later on into Doctor Who. Wow. So suffice to say, uh, if you wanted to go ahead and find that original game, uh, we can probably post it, hopefully not get in any copyright trouble. I'll let uh, John decide <laughs> on that. But I think it would be a very interesting reading for those who are looking for that early history. Yeah, so they've been around for a long time. Yes, the game company Games Workshop started in 1975. 
just a year after they produced the first uh, Dungeons Dragons set was produced by that little company called Tactical Study Ro Rules in uh, Lake Geneva, Wisconsin. Hmm. Otherwise known as TSR, I guess. Yes. What is well, a rogue trader? Rogue tra Okay, that's a good place to start, I think, John. I think we should explain what a rogue trader is. I, from the get-go, from the, from the article that I read in the compendium, they were intending the, the next release of the Warhammer product line in the science fiction, in the science fiction universe to be a direct offshoot of Warhammer. As such, they were expecting dragons to be confronted by space marines and battle armor. They were, they were expecting you know, the traditional elf not to have a bow this time, but to have a laser rifle. So they were, they were really just taking the Warhammer existing universe, which everyone should recognize until its destruction by the Age of Sigmar. The, the, this was going to be the default setting for, for Rogue Trader, and it was going to be a, a character-driven game rather than a miniatures combat game. And the Rogue Trader designation comes from the fact, and everybody should probably know this who's listening, the fact that there were these individuals who traveled the universe engaging in activities of commerce, and they weren't licensed, they weren't sanctioned, they were just there to go ahead and provide you know, goods and services to anyone who needed them throughout the, the frontiers of this empire, this imperium, if you wish. So the Much imperium like the, gave them permission to go out and trade. You know, that, that's a good question. I really don't get that impression when I read the Rogue Trader portion of the Rogue Trader game. Uh -huh. I really get the impression that these guys were just kind of out there on their own, kind of like the, uh, the uh, Yankee uh, merchants, the Yankee traders of, of the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries. They were just out there doing their own thing, as it were, which is kind of interesting when you go ahead and consider that they chose the name Rogue Trader for their game which indicates they were definitely going ahead and focusing this as a, as a role-playing tactical skirmish game rather than a miniatures war game. Yeah, because as I was reading this and as I was looking through the, you know, the intro to it, they did talk about the fact that this is a blend between you know, basically a role-playing game and a tabletop yes. game. Yes. As, as we find out from the rules, you know, they actually have a GM. You know, the idea is you have yes. uh, two people going at it. And there's a GM who kind of referees the battle. Now, just to be uh, just to be totally honest with everybody who's listening, the idea of having a referee in a war game is nothing new. If you go back all the way to 1880, when uh, John when uh, Totten created the game Strategos, uh, they were always implicitly going to have a referee who would be there to adjudicate situations that were either not in the rules or for perhaps you know those blind situations where. You want the fog of war, and you didn't want the person to know what the other person was up to. So, yeah, that that referee is not unique to to Dungeons Dragons or Rogue Trader. So, did you also want to talk about H.G. Wells? What does he have to do with yeah. all this? I mean, let's go ahead and let's talk about the history of the game and see how it evolved. I mean, as I just mentioned, you know, Totten created Strategos as uh, as a war game to help train uh, military officers in in the art of war. And in 1913, H.G. Wells created a little uh, offshoot of this uh, concept called Little Wars. H.G. Uh, Wells, a very famous science fiction author and speculative uh, fiction creator who did all sorts of work that was, that was very philosophical in my opinion, but that's a whole other topic. He decided that he would go ahead and publish a set of rules that he and his friends were, were creating to go ahead and simulate the passion that he had for, for playing with toy soldiers. Lead toy soldiers that were created uh, in massive quantities during the late 1800s for, for boys, and of course what he would call enterprising young girls. And he would go ahead and with his friends create a series of rules that were based around these, these figures that would march in formation. Napoleonic, by the way, I should, I should put out that it was all set in the Napoleonic age, which had a lot of romance surrounding it by the 1880s. And this miniature set of rules would go ahead and involve all sorts of combats, which would be played out on the floor of some, you know, of somebody's house or perhaps even in the backyard. There are some very fascinating um, first uh, for primary source pictures, I should say, or should say of, of H.G. Wells and his friends playing in their either the backyards or their basements. With dice. Now, okay, now that's interesting as you should ask, which dice? None. 
Um, the, the first actual rules stated that when you shot, the most casualties would be inflicted uh, in the following ways. First, by cannon, by artillery. And you might ask, well, how do you know if you hit? Well, back in the day, the toy artillery, the toy cannons that they sold, actually f fired projectiles, <laughs> little oh, wooden so projectiles. Cool. <laughs> uh, and of course, today you'd get in all sorts of trouble. Oh, you, know, you could never do that. Yeah, no, not just today. imagine the warning labels. Exactly. You poke your eye out. Yeah, exactly. Shoot your eye out. That's how you know you won when you went ahead and actually wounded your uh, your opponent. <laughs> no. Um, so when they, they would go ahead and line them up and they would shoot these pellets and anybody who not got knocked down was a casualty. Oh, that's that's awesome. And then if melee was joined or what they would call close combat, it wasn't necessarily melee. It was a combination of close quarter firing and, of course, and eventually maybe a bayonet charge. It was literally a one-to-one -one ratio of, of, of figures being eliminated until one side was, was reduced to a point where it couldn't fight and then it was considered to have run off the field. Wow. So it was, it was chess-like in some ways because there was no randomness involved besides, of course, trying to aim your cannon. But in other ways, it was unique because unlike chess, which has no terrain, you know, there was terrain you would have to consider. You would have to maneuver your forces around, you know, various obstacles. You could uh, – obviously, there was rules for how fast cavalry would move, which, which I should mention had a different ratio as far as taking out infantry, which mm -hmm. made them a little bit more deadly when you got into that close combat. But anyway, I digress. I, I, I started to, you know, think too much about how that game worked. But again, getting back to the original point – that was probably the first commercial war game that exists. With that said, why don't we move on to the actual rules itself? Is there anything else you wanted to add? Well, I do want to point out one other uh, antecedent to the to the Rogue Trader game, and that was called Bronstein. Uh, back in 1969, um, a gentleman by the name of David Wesley had created a set of rules that were fairly unique in the sense that instead of marching formations of troops against one another, you would have one miniature figure representing one soldier. So a one-to-one -one ratio. A one-to-one -one ratio. And that figure actually represented a unique individual, a personality, if you wish. And that took off in a completely different direction with uh, David Ardenson and Gary Gygax eventually developing a medieval version, which eventually became Dungeons and Dragons, which is another topic altogether. But I did want to go ahead and point that out because this is – the, these are the rules that Rogue Trader embraces. One model representing one figure, and in some cases, a very unique personality. So they took all these old ideas, they built upon it, they created this universe, and then they created Rogue Trader. Yes. I love it. So the actual Rogue Trader book uh, came out, what, 1889? 18, 1989. <laughs> 1889. Uh, actually, the the Rogue Trader, yes, I believe that was the date. Uh, no, 1987, bigger pardon. I just checked my notes real quick. 87, thank you. Yes. Boy, imagine the emails of that one. Yeah. So the books at the time, you know, the front cover is a picture of the uh, Crimson Fist, the Blue Space Marines with the red fists. They got the flag up. Uh, they got a Space Marine holding an orc's head. By the helmet they're firing in all different directions which by the way is an interesting choice because you can see that motif in many different arts uh, military art during the time period the 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 last stand if you wish the and then on page three it opens up and it reads for more than a hundred centuries the emperor has sat immobile on the golden throne of earth he is the master of mankind by the will of the gods and master of a million worlds by the might of his inexhaustible armies. He is a rotting carcass writhing invisibly with power from the dark age of technology. He is the carry on Lord of the Imperium to whom a thousand souls are sacrificed every day and for whom, and, and for whom blood is drunk and flesh eaten, human blood and human flesh, the stuff of which the Imperium is made of. To be a man in such times is to be one amongst untold billions. It is to live in the cruelest and most bloodiest regime imaginable. It is the tale of these times. It is the universe you can live today if you dare. For this is a dark and terrible era where you can find little comfort or hope. 
If you want to take part in the adventure, then prepare yourself now. Forget the power of technology, science, and common humanity. Forget the promise of progress and understanding, for these are no, for there is no peace amongst the stars, only an eternity of carnage and slaughter and the laughter of thirsting gods. But the universe is a big place. Whatever happens, you will not be missed. <laughs> this is the it, intro <laughs> to the <yes>. game. <laughs> there are no good different. guys here. <laughs> no, and as a matter of fact, if you want to, uh, the most famous quote paraphrases everything you just said in the grim darkness of man or of the 41st millennium, there is only war. There um, is only war. <laughs> it, 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 has, it has spawned an entire genre called grim dark. Yep. It's dark, it's brutal, it's bloody, and yes, it has survived decades, and this is just a beautiful game. So, like we said earlier, this is kind of like a mixture, like a role-playing game and a tabletop game. Um, in the actual rules itself, once we get past that, we get into the table of contents. Um, it starts off by talking about the scale of the game, where it says um, one inch is equal to two meters which I had to go back and read that again. One inch imperial system equals two meters metric system. <laughs> which I thought was kind of funny. Um, I would imagine at the time uh, England was going through or perhaps they still have a mixture of the imperial system and the metric system. Is that true? The English have always had a difficulty accepting anything from the continent as we can recently see with Brexit. Uh -huh. um, I think they have fully embraced the metric uh, as of now. Um, but yeah, back in the 70s, there was still this discussion about whether or not they should go away from that, that system where they still had, you know, what was it, 24 shillings and 12 pennies. And it was just oh, yeah. a non-decimal system. So yeah, there, there, there is a definite attempt by the British to remain as unique as possible. But here's, here's my comment. I'm going to throw this back at you. Mm -hmm. If you're a science fiction game, do you really want to go ahead and go with something as antiquated as yards and feet? True. I, I don't know. But I just found it interesting because out of all the different additions that we've seen for this game, this is the first time I've actually seen it defined as to what the scale is. Because a typical uh, game of Warhammer, uh, 40,000, is done on a six foot by two foot, four foot board. So, you know, you got your 60 inches by your 48 inches. And this is the first time I've actually seen it to scale, which I thought was kind of interesting. So when you get your models and their actual size, you know, they're an inch and a half tall. These are, you know, eight feet tall space marines walking around. Scale was a big thing in the in the 70s and 80s of wargaming. Everybody wanted to know exactly what how much time a turn was, how much space was uh, represented by an inch or a square or a hexagon or whatever the case may be. Mm -hmm. It was a way that you could measure the game's uh, quasi-reality. And I say quasi because as long as the game functioned what, what could be a, as a simulation of reality, it didn't matter whether or not you could have a rifle that only fired maybe 100 or 200 yards uh -huh. uh, and then you know lost its effectiveness, which is completely unrealistic from an actual hardware Sure, point of sure. view but in relation to other weapons with that you know with the scale in place it made sense uh, let me see and then uh see we come across the dice that are actually used uh, which is used to determine combat and uh resolve conflicts so it looks like we're primarily using well in this version of the game it looks like we're using pretty much all the dice we've got d4s d8s um looks like primarily we we'll use uh, d4s and d6s in other parts of the rules, you will see the D8 being utilized. You'll see the D12, the percentile dice, D10s. And, and here's what I love about Rogue Trader besides just about everything. Um, polyhedras. Uh, again, going back to the uh, 1980s. A polyhedron. Was uh, that a D12? No, a polyhedron is actually the term given to the set of dice, the D4, the oh, D6, okay. the D8, the D10, the D12, and the gotcha. D20. I'm thinking of so, – I'm thinking of uh, – a dodecahedron. Dodecahedron and so on and so forth. Yeah, when you get specifically and you want to get uh, into the actual uh, dice names themselves, they have all those crazy names, tetrahedron <laughs> and so on and so forth. But yeah, the polyhedron applies to all of them. Um, 
Yeah, because we also find that as the game evolves over the years, that they basically do away with the other dice for Warhammer 40,000, and they just kind of stick with the D3 and the D6. And that is a problem, which I'll get to in my, in, in my discussions later. But let me get back to why they use the polyhedra. One, because everybody was. It was the dice to use. I mean, uh, you had the Chaosium line that was using um, all their polyhedras for their basic role-playing slash Call of Cthulhu slash RuneQuest systems. Uh, you had, of course, the very famous Dungeons & Dragons games. And it was just a set of dice to use. But why? And here, here's the crux. If you look at Gary Gygax, he was very enthralled with the D20 because it gave you a, a lot of probability and a lot of, of room mm -hmm. to go ahead and have random uh, items within a table or at random items in, in, a, in a result. Sure, you had and 20 you, different possibilities. Right, exactly. And they were evenly spread out. Unlike, you know, when you roll 2d6 or 3d6, now you're talking about bell curves, yep. which are very difficult to go ahead and, 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 and have make sense in a random system. If you're telling me that I need a 17 or more on 3d6 to hit somebody, you're talking what, about a 1% chance to hit? About. But in a 17 or more on a D20, it's a uniform, that would be about 20%, right? 17, 18, 19, 20, yeah, that'd be a 20% chance to hit. So, and, and when you modify something by plus or minus one, if you're using a D20, that's plus or minus 5%. If you're using 3D6, it's a variable amount of, of yeah. modification. It's a bell percentage. curve because you got three randomized dice going at the right. same time. Exactly. And it wasn't just for the random factor. It was also the utility of having multiple sets of dice. If I create a chart that has eight results on it for, for what happens to my robot when it goes crazy or whatever, if I'm only using D6s, now I have to modify that. I have to maybe get rid of some very interesting results, or maybe I have to expand the chart. And again, going to that less than even distribution. So by utilizing the different types of dice, I now have the ability to go ahead and create those types of tables that are not restricted by a D6. And here's what kills me. I'll go right now to the D6 problem. <laughs> go for it. Knowing, knowing that 40K rogue trader had decided to go with polyhedrons, why in, in, why in the emperor's dark earth did they decide to go ahead and stick with the D6 for combat resolution? and using D6 only. That's a great question. It restricted them so hard on what they could go ahead and do when you got the higher combat skills or weapon skills or ballistic skills, I it should does. say. It does. And it made it so much more difficult to go ahead and put a variety of different types of armor in as well. Well, we also see over the years how that's evolved. And in a later show, we are going to go over the ninth edition rules. And... Uh, to, to kind of show how that's evolved over the years where it's gone from charts and tables to, you know, basically a flat system almost. In my opinion, what Games Workshop should have done, it, it was the 1980s. You're going into second edition, which was uh, second edition Warhammer 40,000, which followed Rogue Trader. They decided to make, make it all six-siders. No, they should have made it all ten-siders. Ten-sided dice were very, very easily access, accessible during this time period. Uh, the ten sided gives you that very nice flat uh, distribution as far as your randomness, and it now allows you for greater, greater uniqueness and greater opportunities within a table. So that's what I'm going to throw out there. I don't know if anybody will agree with me or not. The field of battle is the first section of the actual rules where it talks about the scenery, which I think is interesting. So we see the artwork, we, see, we know, we get a feel for the grim, dark universe, and the first thing they talk about is scenery. So on your battlefield, like I say, you, gen you generally play on a six by four foot table. Uh, they talk about hills. Um, hills are the most uh, common and used scenic items. Models stood on hills receive a combat advantage. So it sounds like whatever you have out there for scenery, there's going to be some advantages and disadvantages to them. So for the hills, uh, it doesn't look like much just from this section, but they also have like woods. You you can put up, uh, so you can have hills and uh, and woods, and they go in and they define what they actually are. Uh, hedges, uh, which is... This is, this is the part that I thought was interesting. For hedges, they say it provides soft cover. 
Uh, then they go in and they define what walls are, and they call that hard cover. And then they define what a, a ditch is, and they also define that as hard cover. And then there's debris and buildings, uh, rivers. They kind of talk about how to make it, and they've got pictures of them. So ideally, you have your board. You've got your scenery out there. That was a very big thing in wargaming was to differentiate the different types of terrain and how it would affect a, a combat operation. So soft sure. cover obviously would be those things that would just obscure your ability to shoot at somebody. Hard mm -hmm. cover would actually have the chance of stopping any sort of bullet and or incendiary or whatever you're throwing at the person. Yep. So it goes in and it defines what each each item is. And if uh, they got pictures and remember, of it. Mm -hmm. And remember that battlefield has to have stalagmites. Yes. <laughs> I found that to be the most weird piece of terrain to throw into a, a list of scenery you should have for your battlefield. Stalagmites. Stalagmites. Where did you see that? Take a look at uh, the next page there where we're on page nine. It goes bridges and forts, cool pools, great bogs, great stalagmites. Stalagmites. <laughs> oh, okay. I see him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, apparently that's the thing. Okay. Why not? Case. Setting up the scenery. GM places the scenery at his own discretion. Players don't get to decide this. The GM does. Uh, the players can arrange and choose scenery using the following rules if they wish to. They roll a D6. Uh, so out of the scenery you wanted to put out on a 1 to 2, you, you get to use one less item. On a three to four, you get the amount that you wanted. On a five or six, you get an additional item of scenery. Isn't that a holdover today too? Don't if you're playing just a randomized scenario, isn't that what you kind of do um, when you're setting up games today? Or no? Am I wrong on that? Not as much, but in ninth edition, scenery does does have more of an effect on the game today than it did back then. Or they may have come around full circle. Uh, the troops characteristics. So now we have our scenery, we have our table, we have our scenery. Now we have our actual troops. And these troops have statistics. They have their movement allowance, which tells them in inches how far that they can move. So if they have a movement value of four, they can move four inches. Here's uh, a side note. You can have a half inch. You, you can move in half inch increments in this game. That is true. That is very true. Uh, you have a weapon skill which indicates um, your ability in hand-to-hand -hand weapons with a lowest value of 1 and the highest value of 10. So it's somewhere between 1 and 10. That is what your weapon skill is. Which, again, why are you using a D6 to resolve the combat <laughs> if you got a 1 to 10 rating system? Just saying. This really bugs you. <laughs> it does. I'm sorry. Uh, after weapon skill, you have a ballistic skill. This is how well you're able to shoot. Again, that's a value between 1 and 10. You have your strength, which is how strong you actually are, which is a val value between 1 and 10. Uh, your toughness, this is how, um, how t t tough you are. Uh, your a characteristic measures the character's natural resistance to damage. That's what the toughness value does. And for uh, those of you who are not familiar with, with earlier uh, versions of the Warhammer game, when you hit your target, Originally, you had to go ahead and see if you actually even wounded them. Um, and then you made your save. So I don't know how many people can actually remember how that worked, but it was always based upon the weapon strength versus the target's toughness. Yep. And then you have the wounds uh, for the characteristic. Uh, some creatures can take more damage than others, uh, either because they have more stamina or because they have little regard for or sense of pain. So this is how much damage that they can take before they actually are removed from the field. Uh, you have your initiative. Uh, this characteristic determines the, the creature's speed of thought and action. Uh, the creature with a low E initiative will be slow and dull-witted. A creature with a high initiative will be fast. In hand-to-hand -hand combat, creatures with a high initiative will be able to strike before their enemies. This is important, which is different from today, because back then, even if it was your turn, and you went to the hand-to-hand -hand phase, the opponent had a higher initiative. They're going first. Uh, after that, the attacks. This is the number of attacks you get in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, then there's a whole other range of personal characteristics. 
you have your leadership. This is uh, this characteristic indicates the creature's ability to command and to react to commands. It reflects innate sense of discipline and obedience. The val the value goes from one to ten. Uh, from there, we move on to the intelligence. Uh, this shows the creature's ability to think and use technical equipment. Again, this is a value between one and ten. Then you have the cool. The characteristic reflects the creature's temperament and its ability to stay calm and under control. So if they lose too many people, I, th I think today they probably call it a leadership test, but this is how well they say, like if their unit uses loses a lot of people, they may need to make a cool test. Then you have your willpower. This is a measure of physical resistance. Uh, a creature with a high willpower can often avoid or escape the effects of psychic attacks. And again, this is a value between one and 10, which we will learn about later. And again, this gets us back to rogue traders and original purpose was to create individual models representing relatively unique individuals. So you have the gamut of attributes, not just ones that were useful for combat, but ones that would go ahead and have applicability. Say if you saw a demon erupt from the ground, well, make a cool test. Or perhaps, you know, if you were trying to go ahead and figure out the uh, ancient Jakaro weapon that was lying at your feet, well, make an intelligence test. So there were all sorts of opportunities for you to go beyond just the, hey, I'm shooting at your guys, you're shooting at my guys. Yep. So for your characteristics to summarize, you have your movement, your weapon skill, ballistic skill, your strength, toughness, the amount of wounds, your initiative, attacks, leadership, intelligence, cool, and willpower. <laughs> this was for a lot of paper, I guess, when it got printed out. Well, it did make for interesting games you because you had that ability to to have your units and your and your models do things that would be unique and that's one of the reasons why many of these games required the referee oh yes because the rules themselves don't tell you you know hey how do you pick a lock or hey can you jump over that you know that gap that's what the attributes are there for the referee will tell you what you have to roll and what characteristic to use and no one should be able to argue about that as long as the referee is fair and not arbitrary. So now that we have our models, we have our characteristics, now we need to organize them. And they are organized into troops. You normally have troops and an officer. Uh, to form unicoherency, they need to stay within two inches of each other. Can I interrupt real quick and just make a comment? Absolutely. Um, one of the things that we need to go ahead and point out about the, the rule book is this is the first time you're going to see this H.R. Geiger looking, or Geiger. Is it Geiger or Geiger? I don't know. I'm going to say Geiger. Sounds good. Um, and that, that very, you know, grim, dark type of illustrations uh, that are not just Geiger, they're all with M.C. Eicher looking too. Uh, it's just, it's this very, it's very different type of art that we're not, that we're not used to seeing during this time period. Which, which just emphasizes, again, the grim, dark nature of, of the game, the, the foreboding sense of these space marines and, and, their, and their almost biological-looking weaponry. Very different. Again, this is what I was trying to allude to earlier. This is an aberration in the 40K universe. There, there's a little bit more biological nature to this whole, this whole universe that I think was missed in later editions, which became more oh, mechanical. Yeah. I mean, a space marine's armor is basically part of him yes i mean you got needles that go into the back constantly injecting adrenaline you know yep. you've got the power supply on the back it's 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 a part of the body and we don't even have to talk about what a dreadnought was back in the day oh no kidding organizing your troops organizing your units uh, no member of any units may be more than two inches away from at least one other member of the same units example a space marine squads a space Marines are moving across clear ground in fairly open formation. No model is no more than two inches away from at least one another. Now, see, in my opinion, this was an artificial holdover from the Warhammer fantasy days where you wanted to keep your troops in formation, not only because it was probably a little bit easier when you were playing the game with multiple miniatures, but also to make it easier for units to be affected by, say, say, area effect weapons and so on and so forth. Uh, I find it, I, I've always found the unit coherency rules to be a bit anachronistic 
Uh, could, I mean, if you were to go ahead and tell a modern infantry soldier, even a World War II infantry soldier, that they they had to stay within, you know, eight feet of one another, you know, I think you'd go ahead and perhaps, you know, have some problems. It would get kind of crowded. I mean, yes, they did. I mean, before all the people in the in the internet world go ahead and comment about, you know, infantry formations in the 40s, 50s, and 60s, yes, I recognize the fact that they often did. But there were occasions where they were definitely not within, you know, that, that eight feet or that six feet or whatever the case may be. They were much closer. So I would like to go ahead and, and comment that perhaps, just in my opinion, that that two inches should have been dependent on the unit's leadership score. That's an interesting idea. So the more leadership they had, the more disciplined they were, the more they could actually not break formation, but possibly have a further distance than just yes. two inches. Because they trusted each other and they had that training. They did not have to be on top of one another. Because if you think about it, in, in uh, Napoleonic warfare, in American Civil War, and you know, even as far back as the phalanxes of the Greeks, the reason why you're shoulder to shoulder is for discipline and for, for, for morale as well as for other factors, which, again, I don't want the Twitter universe to blow up on this. <laughs> we but, would be so lucky. <laughs> uh, exactly. But suffice to say, you know, it was, it was a lot about morale and, and the spirit de corps. And as you increase your, your weapons lethality, as well as you increase your, your training of your individual soldier, that closeness becomes obsolete, and you can start spreading your troops out more uh, to go ahead and take advantage of cover and take advantage of, of that training and that discipline. So I think it should be based on a leadership score. I love it. Um, I think that's, uh, I think our time's up for this show. Um, in our next show, we, we are going to be going over the turn movement, uh, the uh, turn sequence, excuse me, where we are going to first be going over movement and shooting. And if we have time, probably get the hand in hand. Um, everyone, thank you for listening. If you have any questions or comments, please email us at rulesexplained at gmail.com. Um, I'm your host, Rob, uh, John Merritt. And I'm Rob Nothing. Thanks uh, for listening, and we'll see everyone later.